Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first lecture of our online series, Scientifically Speaking, an hour of knowledge sharing with an expert design just for you. I am Anna Opreti, and I'm a first year student at Ashoka University, currently studying economics and computer science, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. There are two things that I absolutely love, science and solving real world problems. As a science student all my life, I was always taught to put blinders on. But as I went ahead and explored all of these world problems, I realized that there was a lot going on and I needed something more than a single approach to one subject. And that's when I came to Ashoka. And I found exactly that. The interdisciplinary approach of Ashoka allows me to explore these world problems through the eyes of leading scientists with their different approaches from a multitude of fields. Our aim with this lecture series is to introduce you to just that, to develop an understanding of this cutting edge research and this interdisciplinary approach that we offer at Ashoka. With a new topic and with a new topic and a thought leader every time, we will explore a new subject from the eyes of data and science. Before I introduce you to our lecturer for tonight, I would like to get some logistics out of the way. I will, talk, I will interview the professor for about 20 minutes. During those 20 minutes, you can send in your questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom. I will ask those questions at the end of those 20 minutes to the professor. You can share your name or answer or send these questions in anonymously. All seminars are recorded and you can find these all, you can find these videos on our YouTube page later. We will share the link with you shortly. Lastly, there will be a quiz to test your knowledge on this subject. And the top five winners will win a very exciting hamper from Ashoka. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Gautam Menon, our speaker for tonight. He is a professor of physics and biology at Ashoka. He is and also teaches at Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai. He was awarded the Swarn Jayanti Fellowship of BST in 2005 and is also a fellow of National Academy of Sciences. His research spans several fields, but he has had a long standing interest in infectious diseases and how to describe them using mathematics and computer science. He's very interested in promoting pub the public understanding of science. He's written a number of articles on science and society and has been invited to various institutes around the world to share his knowledge. I welcome you to the series, Professor. Hello, Anna. So, Professor, how do physics and biology come together? How does one begin understanding these two? So, I can tell you how I started off with it. I, when I finished school, I realized that I really wanted to do physics more than anything else. And that's really because physics is an amazing science. You can write down all of the fundamental laws of physics that we know that really describe physics right from atoms and molecules to the universe at large, to stars, what lies in the space between stars. We can do that with physics, and that's an amazing ability that we understand the world so well to be able to describe it using a simple set of equations that can cover a few pages of, of, of script. So I did my PhD, I went on to study more physics after that. But then I began to think about the frontier of problems that lay beyond physics. And in a sense that really dealt with the complexity of life, which is really about biology. And when you think about biology, of course, the greatest question is how is it that a collection of chemicals like our body can really organize into something that makes that, that can walk, that can think, that can see, that can make music, how does exactly does that happen? How do our brains function? That's another really deep question. So how is it that you can understand all of this, even though you know that the laws of physics must also work there? How does life come about? And what determines life processes? So that was a natural move from physics to thinking about more complex organizations of matter. And then from there again, my interest further widened to think about, as you said, policy, the world, what, what makes the world tick. And certainly there, Thinking about disease was a very natural entry point to thinking about policy, because that's where you really can have, the, thinking about diseases brings in so many different areas. It brings in economics, it brings in health, it brings in mathematics and modeling, it brings in clinical science, it brings in biology. So that's an interesting area where much that is interdisciplinary actually meets. That really represents my interest at the moment. 
Right. So what's the benefit of approaching biology from a physics background? I see that you did physics before and then you came into biology. Was there a special perspective that you had? I think what physics teaches you is how to simplify things. Just so much, but not more. Enough to understand a very complicated object. For example, just the way that the, that the planets move around the sun seemed very complicated. And for many years, for many centuries, it wasn't understood. And we realized that very simple laws of gravitation actually determine that type of behavior. So the idea that you can understand something very complicated on the face of it, in terms of simple mathematical laws and expressions, that there is something there to understand, is, is something that a physicist brings to whatever they do, to whatever, to whatever area they're interested in. And it's interesting to look at biology from that angle. Biology is largely a descriptive science. But when you think about are there laws, like the laws of physics, that may be useful to understanding some small part of biology, where can we use it to predict what biological systems do? And as I said, the underlying question behind all of this is how do living systems live, in quotes, what makes them alive? And that is a question that one can begin to answer. They're not questions that are really confined only to biology. I think these are questions that people from all different areas should think about. Computer scientists should think about them. Mathematicians should think about them. Chemists should think about them. Because these are really hard and difficult questions. And the more people who think about it from different points of view, the easier it will be to make progress. That's super interesting. So I am not from a biology background, of course. So I want to get my basic side before we move on with this talk. What are diseases and how do we begin to understand them at a very fundamental level? Okay, the simplest level, almost all the diseases that you can think of that move from person to person that are infectious diseases or communicable diseases come from microorganisms of basically two types. They can be bacteria or they can be viruses. Bacteria are small, but they're not so small that you can't see them under a reasonable microscope that you might have, for example, in a school lab or in even a more advanced laboratory that you might get in college. But viruses are different. Viruses are even smaller, and you need very, very complicated microscopes, electron microscopes to actually look at them. There are diseases that are caused by bacteria. For example, tuberculosis is a bacterial disease, and the influenza is a viral disease, and our friend COVID-19, which we're going to talk about today, is also a viral disease. So these are the, the real, the microorganisms that give rise to diseases that are infectious. Remember, there are also good bacteria and bacteria that cause disease. They, we are surrounded by bacteria. Our skin is covered with bacteria. The inner linings of our stomach and gut are covered with bacteria. But they are bacteria that live with us happily. So we shouldn't think of them just as enemies. They are also, in many ways, also part of us. But there are bacteria that do cause diseases, and there are viruses that do cause diseases. And that's what we're interested in today when we talk about how to model or how to think about how diseases move from person to person. So as you talk about the distinction between bacteria and viruses, I have a question come, that's come to me, but I would like to ask our audience first. So we're going to launch a poll right now asking you a question and do let us know what you think about it and we will follow up on that. Can you read the question out, Anna? I can't see it. Yeah, so the question is, should you take antibiotics if you contract COVID-19? So we have two options, yes or no. And we're waiting for the poll answer to come in. Remember, Professor made a distinction between them, but I have a hint. All right, so we're about to close the poll. All right, so, wow, that's pretty surprising. 81% of the people have said that we should not take antibiotics if we contract COVID-19. 
whereas 19% of the people have said yes. That's very surprising. I thought that we should take antibiotics if we contract COVID-19. I'm, I'm, I side completely with the 80%. You should not take antibiotics if you contract COVID-19. COVID-19 is a viral disease. It comes from viruses. And, and, and antibiotics don't attack viruses. They attack bacteria. And this is important to remember because often we have antibiotics without thinking about it. We, for example, if we have the flu, the tendency is to have a medicine, to pop it into our mouth as an antibiotic and hope that it will have some effect. The reason you shouldn't do that is because antibiotics can pick up resistance to the medicines that you have them too often. The problem of antibiotic resistance is a very real problem. It means that antibiotics that we've used earlier become resistant, that bacteria that we've used that have seen these antibiotics earlier can become resistant to those antibiotics later. And then these will cease to be useful and you have to find new antibiotics in order to deal with them. So I'm glad that 80% of the audience did come up with the right answer. Yeah, we have a very smart audience with Absolutely. us Absolutely. So Professor, can you tell us more about coronavirus? What do we know about it? Where, is it? where has this virus come from? So the virus originated in China, in a city called Wuhan. And it may have originated in what's called a wet market in Wuhan. We're not completely sure about that. The Chinese authorities tried to control the spread of it locally. But the problem with diseases that are highly infectious is that they can never really stay in one place. The moment you have people traveling out, going to other places internationally, you have people moving from China to the US, to India, to various other places, carrying the disease with them. In fact, that's how the disease first came to India, with a group of students who came back from China on vacation, but they happened to be infected with it. So then they had to stay and they recovered fine and they're completely okay. But that's really the secret of how diseases spread. And that's also why diseases spread so fast nowadays. It's because of this huge network that connects cities all over the world. You can fly from one city to another city within, within about 24 hours anywhere in the world. And that's really one reason why our world now is in a sense less capable of dealing with epidemics of disease than it was say 100 years ago. This is the first time we're hearing of a lockdown. Like India recently extended its lockdown. The entire world is on a lockdown. And surely there have been other diseases, infectious diseases, diseases like polio, TB, they're surely more deadly. So what makes COVID-19 so special? Why do we have a lockdown for COVID-19? Oh, that's a very good question. The answer is that for polio, we have a vaccine. For tuberculosis, we have medicines. Tuberculosis is a bacterial disease. For COVID-19, there is no medicine, there is no vaccine, and it's potentially a fatal disease to a small number of people. This is a deadly combination. It's a disease that spreads fast from person to person. It's a disease that you cannot have a med medicine for because there has been no medicine developed for it. There are no antivirals, as they're called, that have been developed for the disease. They, there is no vaccine that you can give people that protects them against the disease. And it's potentially a fatal disease for some small fraction. That fraction of people for whom it's fatal seems to be around, let's say, about 2%. That's the best guess. It usually affects people who are older, people who have some other types of health conditions associated with them, for example, diabetes or some heart condition or some lung condition. But this is what makes it dangerous. And that's a very good question that you asked. Yes. So just a follow-up question on that. Why is our response so slow? Why can't we, like, if we know that the answer is developing a vaccine, why haven't we been able to deal with it so far? Again, that's a great question. The reason is that vaccines take a long time to develop. It's not as though a lab, someone can sitting in a lab or even 10 or 20 labs can churn out a vaccine within a space of days and give it to people. The process of developing a vaccine takes anywhere between a year to a year and a half if you're really lucky. That's a very fast process if that happens. There are many labs around the world that are working currently to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. But that's the sort of time scale that we're looking at. It's not just developing what might potentially be a vaccine. You have to make sure that it works, that it actually protects people against the disease. And you have to make sure that it doesn't harm the people that you're giving it to. Because that's, again, it has no negative side effects of having the vaccine. So in order to be completely sure that the vaccine is both safe and effective, you have to do this sort of long-term development of a vaccine. Hmm. As I think more about the vaccine, I think more about where COVID-19 originated from. I heard it came from animals and it's called a zoonotic disease, but I'm not entirely sure what that means. Could you explain that to us, please? Again, that's a very interesting question. So it turns out that of what we know to be emerging diseases, or new diseases that we haven't encountered before, about three out of every four of these new diseases comes from animals in some way. 
this particular disease came from bats. It sort of came from bats through in some intermediate animal. And presumably this happened in the marketplace in Wuhan. We're not completely sure about that. But after that, it doesn't matter where it came from, because once it gets into human beings and it's able to be transferred easily from human being to other human beings, then its identity as an infectious disease of human begins to take over. Then you can potentially have a pandemic at that point. If this is a disease that spreads fast enough and can't be contained. <clears throat> so that's really what makes this disease, as I said, somewhat different. It does come from animals, as do most other types of new diseases that we haven't seen before. And we will talk about this maybe a little later at the end about how exactly the relationship between man and his environment, or between mankind and their uh, ecology, the ecological surroundings that they have, are important in determining what new diseases will come. So if this disease has come from animals and can't come through animals, should I stay away from my pets? Uh, should I, like a pressing question for me is, should I stop eating non-vegetarian food? And should we stay away from bats? So the answer to all of these questions is no. Certainly, you should not stay away from non-vegetarian food. The food you eat has nothing to do with the virus at all. At the moment, don't worry. Your pets are completely safe. Stay with them. They need you as much as you need them. The last question was about bats themselves. Remember, under normal circumstances, you never really encounter a bat. They fly around far away. They're not really affecting you. They have their caves in which they live in. Bats are part, as much part of your environment as you or me. So always, whenever we think about our larger environment, our larger position ecologically, we must make sure that we don't disrupt little parts of it because everything is one connected whole. And that's something that's important to remember, that, that there is nothing to fear about our environment. There's nothing that is bad about bats. It just happened that this came through a bat, but we need bats as much as we do any animal that lives on this earth to be part of our larger ecosystem. Hmm. Okay, that's very refreshing and I'm glad that that's there. Um, so as this disease sounds very complicated and of course it's affected a lot of us. So when you as a scientist begin to study this disease, how do you even tackle something that's such a, at such a large scale and so complicated? So when I think about diseases, I think about it from more of a physics and a mathematics perspective, but the ideas are very simple and easy to explain. So the way we think about diseases at the simplest level is to imagine a whole population of people. Let's, exam let's imagine the population of Delhi or Kolkata or Chennai. Or I can then imagine looking at everybody in the city and putting them into one of three boxes. They're technically called compartments. I can put them into a susceptible box, a susceptible compartment, because these are the people who can potentially catch the disease. I can put them into an infected box, because these are people who already have the infection and they can infect other people. Or I can put them in the recovered box, which is what happens to people after they recover from an infection. Of course, as I said, some small fraction of people may die from this infection, in which case I would put them in a dead box, but we won't talk about that. This model is really the simplest way to think about what a disease does. It just partitions people into different parts of populations, into different compartments. And given any person, I can tell which compartment they actually fit in. The next step, of course, is to look at how people move between compartments. As you fall ill, once you fall ill, once you're infected with the disease, you no longer belong in the susceptible compartment. You should move to the infected compartment. As you recover from the disease, you should move from the infected compartment to the recovered compartment. So this movement between compartments is the next big idea when you think about this mathematically. The last twist to this is something that you might have anticipated, that in order to move for a susceptible person to move to the infected compartment, they must be in the vicinity of someone who is infected, because that's the only way. If I just take a susceptible person and I surround them everywhere by other susceptible people, they will never catch the disease. So then the idea is that the presence of the infected person must influence the susceptible person to become infected. And that's how the whole question of how disease moves across people in the population turns up. So you have susceptible people becoming infected and then becoming recovered in turn. That's so beautiful and simple. And I can see how physics has in, in, inspired all of this in this modeling. Um, so what kind of data do you need when you're beginning to build this model up? And how do you figure out how many people are susceptible, infected? Where does this data come from? So certainly one question is, does anyone have any prior immunity to this disease? Because then they're not really in the susceptible box because nothing will make them fall ill. They're, they have immunity. For a disease like COVID-19, it's unusual because our bodies have never seen it before. So we have no natural immunity to COVID-19. Therefore, all of us technically belong to the susceptible compartment. 
and it just takes a few people in the infected compartment to come along and potentially make us infected again. So that's what makes it special. So these rates at which you move from one box to the one box, which one the susceptible box to the infected box, is what goes into the model. And an idea of how many people are susceptible is another thing that goes into the model. And that's how we begin to study it. So here's again a nice example. So this is a picture of just how the number of infected people in the population changes with time. So it starts off with maybe just one person infected and everyone else susceptible. Then as you move forward in time, so that's on the x-axis, the number of days, this curve goes up, it peaks, and then it begins to come down. And at long times, what happens is you have the number of infected people goes, become smaller and smaller and smaller. And the number of people who recover become larger. And there may be a few susceptible people left in the population. And that's how we think about it. So this model surely would apply to a lot of other infectious diseases as I understand it. So how do we differentiate in this model for a disease like COVID-19? Well, again, a great question. That's, so one way of thinking about how diseases spread is to ask, if I take one infected person, how many people does that person infect on average? Okay. So that idea is something called the basic reproductive ratio. And the idea there is, I may, have inf I may infect two people at one point. So those two people will infect further people. And then this will, whole cycle will go on. So now the question that you can ask of any disease is what happens, how many people does one infected person infect when they start off? If that number is larger than one, then for example, if I infect two people, one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, and so on. And that's the number that increases. If I'm infecting less than one person, that's the number that's going to go down. So there is a critical or a special value of the reproductive ratio above which an epidemic will grow and the number of infected people will grow and below which the number of infected people will come down. That's super interesting. I'm very curious as to what these reproductive ratios will be. But before we do that, I would like to test what are all... So the question is, which number do you think the basic reproductive ratio of COVID-19 is closest to? The options are 1, 10, 100, and 1,000. So we'll wait for everyone to vote and see what comes in. In the background, we have some of the reproductive ratios for other diseases that we know about. So Ebola is 2, swine flu is 2, HIV is 4, smallpox is 7, and measles is 18. Okay, so the results from the poll are here. 21% um, think it's closest to 1, 43% think it's 10, 32% think it's close to 100, and 8% think it's close to 1,000. Professor, what do you think? Yes, I'm glad that the numbers between 1 and 10 have uh, certainly dominated. The number is believed to be somewhere around 2.4 or 2.5, and scientists are still arguing about what exactly that number ought to be. So that's a good guess. So it's not as infectious as measles. And you know that children can catch me even if you have children who are susceptible to measles who haven't been vaccinated. If there's one child anywhere in a classroom, pretty much everybody gets it. So these are highly infectious diseases. And COVID-19 is not on that scale of measles, but it's somewhere around swine flu, let's say, around 2.4, 2.5. Wow, I would have guessed a much higher number for COVID-19, definitely. So as we talk about models and what factors are there in it, naturally, how do you control for other factors such as, say, the economic factors or the social factors? And how do you make this model much closer to what we would see in reality? So these models are really concerned with health and the state of health of a person. And 
But one thing that they do, for example, as I said, the reproductive ratio depends on many things. And it can be controlled by many things. It depends upon the disease itself. It depends upon the way people interact in order to transfer the disease from one person to the other. And that's where the idea of distancing comes in, which we will probably get to, I think, a little later. And that's the fact that the more separation you have between people, the harder it is for a disease that is really transmitted through a respiratory route to move from one person to the other. And that's an important concept that we need to think about, about how exactly we can control the rate at which a disease is transferred and what determines that. So whenever we think about how epidemics spread, that's a very important part of that thought. Right. So do we also think about factors such as the economy or do we take into consideration the social systems that are there or anything of that sort when you're understanding epidemics? So as you, as you think about epidemics at a deeper level, so this was just a simple mathematical model for how a disease spreads. But as I said, it depends upon many other factors, some of which are social. Exactly how many people are affected by a disease and what you do to deal with that disease will involve economic factors. For example, we have a lockdown at the moment. So many people are unable to return to work. They've been away from work for a long period. That certainly has economic consequences. And from models like these, we can add them to economic models. We can add them to social models to try to understand what is the large scale impact of something like this. So as an economist, I should also be able to understand these biology models that you create to understand and make better public policies. It's super interesting. And so I noticed that when you were talking about it, you mentioned distancing and you didn't say social distancing. So can, just a question about that, like why aren't we going with social distancing and what's the difference? Yeah, again, that's a great question. The, the term that you will read, you, that you will hear in the papers and the news is often social distancing. But that's not so nice because it sort of says that we should be socially distant from each other. But the right word is really physical distancing. You want to be physically distant from people, but you do want to be socially close to them. These are difficult times for everybody all around the world. These are times for you to stay in touch with the people who you love, who you care about. Make sure that your social bonds are strong so that you can cope with the fact that you're physically distanced from each other. This is something to keep in mind that we now prefer to use the word physical distancing as opposed to social distancing because that conveys the idea better that what we're really after is to make sure that people don't come close enough together that if one is infected, they can transfer the disease to someone who isn't. Right. Another question, when we talk about social, like physical distancing, as you said, we talk about this term, we talk about this term of flattening the curve and we often talk about there's this curve that we need to flatten. So what exactly is this curve that we are flattening and how does it fit into the model that we discussed? Okay, wonderful question. So if you remember the model, we looked at the number of infected as a function of time. It went up and then it came down. The peak value is the largest number of people who are infected at that time. So now the question is, if I have a certain number of hospitals throughout my country or even within my city, does that maximum number of infected people of whom, let's say, a large fraction will need to go to hospital, will need to see a doctor, may need to go to ICU, how do these numbers compare with each other? You don't want the number of infected at any point to be larger than what your public health system can cope with. You want to keep it lower. So that's the idea of pushing the curve down. And you can see nice examples here, the different values of R0, of how these curves, the, the maximum value of that curve, the peak of that curve is pushed down as you change R0. So that suggests something, that if you really want to deal with a disease that is infectious and has some R0 to start out with, one way of dealing with it and making sure that your health system, your public health systems can cope with it is to push that value of R0 down. So distancing, as we said, physical distancing helps you do that, makes it just that much harder for you to transfer the disease to somebody else. It pushes the curve down and spreads it out over a longer period of time. The advantage is that you will never have hospitals that are completely filled with people waiting to come in, the sort of chaos that you might have expected in an emergency room or an ICU unit. You're always keeping the numbers down to levels that your public health system, then your hospitals, then your doctors, then your ICU can actually cope with. That's what is meant by flattening the curve. It's putting affected people down so that it can be managed better. Oh, thank you so much, Professor. I have so much more clarity on that. It was something that like, kept nagging me all this while. Another question that I had for you now that like, I am personally interested in epidemics after this entire thing is happening and I want to know what to do about it. Right? So what can we do in the next 
20 years or if some disease like this again pops up in another 20 years, what can you do to better respond to it or even prevent it for that matter? Is there something that we, the young generation, can study or do more about to better respond to such a situation in the future? See, that's a great question. And I think the first thing to remember is increasingly we realize that diseases, that thinking about diseases is not something that's the province of just one field, for example, just doctors or clinical people or even people who are epidemiologists or virologists. The problems with dealing with infectious diseases are really much larger. They're global. As I said, the fact that you can fly from one city to another city within a matter of hours makes sure ensures that a disease here is a problem of the world. It's not just a problem of that country or that city or that district or that local region. So the fact that many, many different areas and many, many people who are trained in different things must come together to realize this. We must have economists, we must have sociologists, for example, to what is the social effect of distancing of any kind? How does that affect our society? You need psychologists. How does the sheer act of distancing that happens when you lock down a population for a long period of time, how does that change people's psychology? How do you make it easier for them to deal with it? So the other thing, of course, is more funding. What you should, as young people, look for is to make sure that science is better funded because the more people we have who think about viruses, who think about bacteria, who think about disease, and who look at these problems, and many of them are very basic and fundamental problems in biology. That's bio there could be problems in biology, there could be problems in mathematics that deal with that part of biology. There could be problems in epidemiology, which is another beautiful field that thinks about epidemics. You need all of these people to work together in a concerted way to try and understand how to deal with the problem of diseases. The other point, of course, is the second point, the other very important point is that we need really a top quality public health system. And that, I think, is really the lesson of a disease like COVID-19. In order to be able to cope with an epidemic, a pandemic that spans not just one country, but multiple countries, we need the public health system in each of those countries to be strong, to be able to deal with all the whole range of people, right, from the rich to the poor, must have access to a high quality public health system. That itself demands many other things. It demands good sanitation. It demands that we work on the problem of eradicating poverty in our country, because all of these affect public health. The last sort of point that I wanted to make was, we must learn how to live better with our environment. As I said, a lot of new emerging diseases are zoonotic diseases. But these diseases come about because we are pushing against the boundaries of our environment. We're coming into contact because of deforestation, because of our urge to plunder the natural wealth of this world. We are putting ourselves and wild animals in situations where they're far more in proximity with us than they should naturally be. And that's when this whole capacity for diseases to move from one to the other comes. So we should think more ecologically. We could think about ourselves as just one more denizen of this particular planet with certain responsibilities to the planet, to the ecological situations around us, to keep our rivers clean, to keep our air pure. All of these are important and all of us are in it together. Thank you so much, Professor. You have clearly cleared a lot of my doubts and I have a much better understanding of COVID-19 now. Uh, I would now like to move to the Q&A session because I think a lot of our viewers also had a lot of doubts and a lot of questions to ask you. Uh, so Mohit Bishnoi asked, why do viruses, virus diseases create more epidemics than bacteria-based diseases? Um, so there are epidemics also of bacterial diseases. So we, it's just that the ones that we hear about most nowadays, for example, for dengue that we have, which is a viral disease, or with, um, with H1N1, which is a type of influenza, all of these turn out to be viral diseases, typically with both with H1N1 and with COVID-19, and with SARS before that. These are diseases that the human beings had not seen before. And therefore, our ability to cope with them is reduced. And these have potential to become pandemics, just as COVID-19 has. But, so there are, there is always, for example, a steady background in this country of tuberculosis, of people affected with tuberculosis. And you may not see it flare up. You could see that in local places. But remember that it's always there. It may not have the, the sort of immediate cachet of an epidemic like COVID-19. But these diseases are always there with us. Right. So bacteria and viruses are equal chances of creating these epidemics and pandemics. Uh, super interesting. Harsha Chabra has another question. He asks, can we use the modern technologies of gene editing to make the infectious strains of diseases like COVID-19 less infectious? 
Um, it would have been nice if that were true, but these trains move from person to person. So it's hard to edit them inside people. So it's really not possible to do that in any way that we understand to be able to. You can do this inside a laboratory. You can cut up the genome of COVID-19 in interesting ways because we have the tools and techniques to do that. But once the disease comes out into the human population, it becomes much harder, almost impossible to do anything of that sort. Right. Uh, Siddharth Mukherjee asks, how different is SARS-CoV-2 uh, from SARS-CoV, which spread in 2003? In many ways, they're similar. They're both coronaviruses. But, but COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus that causes COVID-19, seems to spread a little better between people than the original SARS disease did. And that's partly because it appears that, that SARS-CoV-2, which is responsible for the coronavirus, which is responsible for COVID-19, seems to be able to infect people in such a way that they don't know that they're infected. A large fraction of the population, let's say about 80% of them, may be infected with it, but not know it because they never show <clears throat> symptoms appropriate to that. This is something that SARS didn't do earlier when it came in, in the early 2000s. And that's what is the difference. At some level, they're similar. At some level, they're quite different. The next question is something even I had. We hear of these, we hear of these ca like cases that COVID-19 is coming again and reactivating. And Anupam Ghosh had the question, is the virus mutating? What do we know about this? So viruses always mutate. They always change. The sort of, so the influenza virus, for example, changes from year to year. So you, the, the, if you have a, a vaccine against influenza, that has to be changed from year to year because the nature of what circulates from year to year changes. <clears throat> Over here, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus also changes from year to uh, changes, but luckily it's not changing very fast. So we do know that there are many different strains of this virus that exist. We know the strain that differs. So the important, the usefulness of understanding these strains is figuring out where a virus came from. So the original strains in India came from Wuhan. We know that because we know what the sequence of that virus is. But viruses change. Hopefully they may change to become a little less virulent, but we don't know that yet. Right. Akash Rao had a similar question. So he asked, why do people who've been cured of COVID-19 contract it again? Does their body not develop a resistance to the disease? So from all that we understand about diseases, their body should develop. You become immune to a disease after having contracted it and recovered. I know there are recent examples that have been in the paper of, of people in China and in, in, in Korea who seem to have contracted it again. So then the question is, what exactly happened to these people? Were they discharged from hospital without a test really showing that they were free to go? Maybe that test went wrong. So these patients were released earlier and before they should have. We really don't know yet what exactly is going on. Based on what we know, we believe that once you have contracted the disease, you should have immunity to that disease for at least some time. It might last for a month. It might last for a year or a few years. It might last even for your whole lifetime. But it would be odd to catch it so fast. So it either means that we don't understand enough about the disease, or it means that there was something special about these patients and what we know about immunology and the biology of this disease is still intact. Kamal Singhji has this question. He asked, how much time would it take to develop this herd immunity against COVID-19 in India? So that's again a very good question. What's meant by herd immunity is that once a sufficiently large fraction of the population has got the disease and thereby become immune to it, it's not necessary that everyone in the population should have got it in order to be immune. As long as something like 60 to 70% of your population has got it once and developed immunity, that protects the remaining 30% who may not have got it. The usual way of getting herd immunity is to give people vaccination, which is why you're vaccinated. You have a whole schedule of vaccinations that starts right from the time that you're born and lasts for several years after that. And there are even vaccinations that you can take when you're much older. For example, the influenza vaccination that you can have at any point. You're recommended to have it once a year. And so these vaccinations really help to protect you against diseases. That's what is important about what they're doing. Right. Um, so Rajesh Akshitan asked, the world did not conquer HIV fast enough through very effective medicines despite all the awareness. So does this experience not pose a risk of COVID-19 as well? I think with the intensity of people working on COVID-19, I think there was much more pressure on, 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 on finding a cure for COVID-19 
than there was in the early days, certainly, of HIV AIDS. And that's why it took a long time. HIV AIDS is also a very, um, a very malleable and a very, very worthwhile enemy in terms of changes very fast. And there are many things that we understood about HIV AIDS that came much later in terms of our ability to deal with it. And now we do have medicines. So it's not, it's not an automatic death sentence to have HIV AIDS. You can actually live with it for a long period, a period of time. Whereas with COVID-19, because it's a new disease that our body hasn't seen, because it's potentially fatal for a small number of people, there is a lot, of, and it's now a pandemic. It now covers every country in the world pretty much, 226 of them. There is a lot more pressure on both companies, on, research, on researchers all over the world to come up with a medicine. So I expect that a vaccine will come sooner rather than later. Right. We have some very statistics-related questions that have come in, and I'm very interested to, like, excited to ask you those. So Neil Malhotra asked that, do you think a data-driven, statistics-based approach could predict the cycle of this virus and when it would end based on past data, like, such as China's recovery, recovery and other virus instances in the past? Certainly, looking at data is useful in many points of view. And one particular use of data that I can point out is the fact that if I knew what, what, if I knew more about the patients who fell ill and patients who recovered, patients who died, and patients who were critically ill, I could try and figure out what makes these patients different if I had enough data about them. Then when some new patient comes into my emergency ward, let's say, I can figure out these, this person is more likely to recover and this person is more likely to have problems that might later lead to more to requiring much more medical attention than they would otherwise. So that's an example where a lot of data about patients can be mined in order to provide information about what they might do, what their trajectories might be once they fall ill. The other question, of course, is the ability to identify outbreaks. If you hear of an isolated set of cases here or there or somewhere, is there a larger pattern to this? Is there something behind my, these observations that tells me that this, this could build up in order to become an epidemic at some point? That's again something that big data can actually do. That's something that big data, again, would be very useful to understand. Of course, the third point is there are many cases where people who work on the modeling of diseases need very large computers. They run very large and complicated programs that try to simulate this disease in a population. That's another example where big data, big computers, computer science will actually come into play. Right. Um, so when we're doing this, like I just had another question when we talk about this, we have a fair idea of the reproduction rate. And this is a question Jay Kapoor also had, that we had an idea, we talked about the reproduction rate. So why is it so uncertain when these cases will reduce? Because when we have a number and we have all these factors, so why are we so uncertain about when these cases will go down? Because, I mean, this is a very simple description of a disease that gives you the reproductive rate. We sort of assume that everybody is in each of these boxes. There are susceptible people, there are infected people, and there are recovered people. But this doesn't take into account other facts that we know about people themselves. And that's where your, your questions about sociology and economics comes in. Certainly, crowded Bombay localities are very different in terms of the ability of people to infect other people. Then, for example, a rural area in the Himalayas in Uttarakhand somewhere, let's say. So the, the density of people is certainly a variable that affects how much, how easily a disease is transferred from one person to the other. There may be other factors that we can put into this, into this description. So the real answer is that it's not as simple as just a single number. That number is useful from some points of view, but we really need to know much more about how people interact, the different ways in which this number can vary across the whole country. It may be different in Tamil Nadu, may be different in Bengal, it may be different in Maharashtra. These small differences that relate to the way society is structured, the way physical interaction between people are structured, may influence a local reproduction number in these areas. And that's something that we have to try and understand better. We have a very interesting follow-up question that's come to the different geographies that we have talked about. So is COVID-19 temperature independent or does it depend on what the temperature is in all of these different places in terms of how we respond to it? That's a great question. Wouldn't it be nice if it were temperature dependent and it all went away by summer? The answer is that we don't know. And we really don't know at all what might happen when it gets hotter. And in fact, when it gets more humid, once the rain starts. There are some viruses, for example, influenza in the temperate regions of the world tends to be fairly seasonal. It's really a disease of the winter months. And it sort of goes away by summer. And the reasons for that appear to be fairly complicated. We don't know yet whether COVID-19 will do that, whether it will just stay as a background throughout the summer, 
or whether it will go away in the summer and then maybe never come back, or whether it will go away in the summer and then come back later in the year in a second wave. All of these are questions that we are trying to understand as researchers and scientists who work on this particular virus. All right. That, yeah, I wish it went away by summer. <laughs> I would have my summer internship back and college would open soon. Uh, the last question that we have for today for you is that could you please give us uh, some idea about the progress that's achieved in the re on the research front during this precious window that in, especially with regards to India and the situation here, when can we expect this lockdown to end? And where are we on the scientific research front? So when did the lockdown end? Well, the lockdown has already softened a bit. We had a long period of three weeks, which is, a, which is a true lockdown. And now we're hearing that beyond the 20th of this month, there will be some region that will be allowed to have softer versions of the lockdown, depending upon whether they've had cases in the recent past or not. And that's, again, very good policy, that you look to see where the cases are, you look at your ability to control those cases, and you say that if it looks as though the situation might go out of control, that's when I have to clamp down on that area, isolate it geographically, and try to contain the disease at that point. So at this point, it's a little too early to figure out where we're going with this and whether these strategies will work. Um, one difficulty, as I said, is that this is an international disease. You may control it here, but the moment you have someone from outside, from another state, from another city, from even from abroad coming back carrying that disease, you run the risk of starting it off again. So at least until a vaccine is obtained. Once we have a vaccine, we can hope to, to vaccinate a large fraction of our people and then provide the requisite herd immunity to protect people who are still who don't who have who the vaccine has not reached. Where are we with research, especially in India? Well, there, again, there are lots of groups in India who work on this. There are people who work at the Serum Institute and the Translational Health Sciences and Technology Institute who work on developing vaccines for this disease. There are researchers like myself who work on developing models for these diseases. There are economists, sociologists, lots of people all over the country who are looking for solutions that are Indian to enable us to deal a little better with this disease. So on, on the situation of lockdown, then where will we be? The right answer is, I don't know. Let's hope this will get softer. Let's hope that good things might happen by summer in terms of what the virus can do. But as of now, the science doesn't point in any way particular on that particular test. Thank you so much, Professor. So I'm so glad that you answered all of these questions. And I have such a better knowledge. I would also like to thank all the people who asked such brilliant questions on the chat box. I wouldn't have thought, that, thought of them on my own. So thank you for helping us better under, get a better sneak into Professor's brain and his research. Um, so this is where I would like to end our interview with you. Thank, thank you so you, much again. Thank you, Anna. Um, we had, just for you know, we had about 650 learners today and close to 400 questions that came in. Uh, we will now have a quiz for all of these people. Uh, the quiz, again, you can go into the chat box to access this quiz. But before we get into that, we'll tell you more about it. Uh, I would again like to thank everyone for coming and joining us in the session, for asking such brilliant questions, for Professor for answering them so patiently. And again, this is just a sneak peek into what happens at Ashoka. Sessions like these are essentially what I experience in class every day. So please take a look at Ashoka's website. And do think of it as an option if you like this session, if you like the question answers and exploring into world problems like these from an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, we now move to the quiz section. The quiz, the link for the quiz is in the Q&A section. Again, the top five winners will get very exciting hampers. So jump on right to that. Thank you so much.
right so i see some of your questions the quiz is on the ch chat box in the section so you can copy the link if it's and put it on your browser thank you so much we have already received close to 150 responses everyone here is super competitive i love that um there is some housekeeping stuff that you want to talk to you about and also further links for you to follow up to this talk uh, so i request for you to stay on for a little longer Right. Thank you so much for participating in our quiz and being a part of this talk. This wouldn't have been as exciting as it was if it wasn't for your brilliant questions. Um, please look out for our post lecture email for additional reference materials in case you had additional doubts about the topic and wanted to know more. Please do follow us on social media to get regular updates on the scientifically speaking series. We have a lot more lectures coming up for you and a lot of knowledge to share. your input again is very valuable to us so please take a minute to fill out our feedback form so we get a better idea of what to work on and how to improve to give you a better lecture and a better series coming ahead thank you so much again i can't thank you enough for joining us today and hope this was very helpful in understanding covid better i certainly have developed a very interesting and a very sound understanding of the disease and i'm feeling very positive about doing ecore and computer science and learning more about solving this epidemic thank you so much again